Good evening. Welcome to First Baptist Church this evening. We're so glad that you are here. If you're visiting with us, thank you for joining us this evening for the Lord's Supper and celebrating Palm Sunday today. Remind you that there are prayer cards in the pew back in front of you. If you'd like to fill those out, we'll make sure they get to the intercessory prayer team. If you'll make sure they get into the offering boxes in the foyer or over here to my right. Tonight, our ringers and our teenage choir are going to be leading us in a time of worship together. Let's do that together. Let's stand together as we sing. I grew up in a ministry home. We were a part of great Baptist churches growing up and was familiar with how the Annie Armstrong offering was put to such incredible use. But growing up in Alabama, it's kind of scary to think that we were gonna come out here to try something that we had not done before, that we knew the Lord was calling us to, but didn't wanna do it alone. The context here in Las Vegas is much different than the context in Alabama, and one of that is just religious awareness. 60% of our city would identify with no religion at all. 
And because of that, I think we have a unique opportunity to introduce them to who Jesus is. It really makes me think of Maki's story. I met Maki for the first time. He showed up at one of our events before we launched called an invite night. My name is Maki Pizzolo. I'm a professional MMA fighter, which is a professional mixed martial arts fighter. Um, I never thought that God would love a person that fights and looks towards violence for a living. But before Favorite City Church started, Joseph led me to Christ. And I would say that today, my life is blessed. I couldn't even put it into words. My guy is blessing me left and right, bro. And that, that's, that's legit. I didn't even know church planting was a thing until I met them, but, um, and I'm looking forward to be able to go out and help make more disciples and really turning the tides in people's lives. Yeah, so now we're in a space where we're seeing over 150 people engaging at our church. We've seen over 30 professions of faith. So the freedom that we get from the Annie Armstrong Easter offering is that we get to engage with people like my friend Maki. We get to take our time and then that's where we're able to see the disciple making process happen and the church be born. We still have an opportunity to give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. They're offering uh, envelopes over here. You can just designate that in, in your offering. Uh, at the end, our missionary said this gives them the opportunity to have more time to share. They're not having to fundraise. They're not having to, a lot of them come back to the States and spend a lot of their year fundraising to be able to be missionaries. Through the cooperative program, they can continue witnessing and serving their community. What an incredible story of how Christ is using them to win souls to him. Let's stand together as we sing. <clears throat>
Thank you, Brother David, for providing wonderful music for us tonight. And all of these wonderful people have helped you. In just a few moments, we're going to read in John chapter 13, if you'd like to turn there in the scripture. And then toward the end of this service, we will be partaking of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to do something that is next to impossible. I'm going to ask you to wait to open the element and we'll all do it together, okay? Because the minute I shift to the Lord's Supper, some of you are going to start jerking plastic off of here. <clears throat> and, you know, I don't like the old way we used to do this where we passed out the trays and the bread's just sitting there and all kinds of fingers go through it before it gets to you. <clears throat> These are much more sanitary. But at the same time, <clears throat> they're very noisy, especially when you decide to go ahead and do that before it's really the time for us to do that. Now, if you don't want to listen to the sermon, you can figure out that there's two little pieces of plastic on your lid, and you can get the clear one ready, because that'll be the first one that we pull off, and then the second one uh, you can pull off when that is appropriate also. But tonight, I want us to spend several of our minutes in the Word of God, and we're going to a chapter <clears throat> that really we just looked at on Wednesday night just a few weeks ago. Uh, if you're not familiar with my Wednesday night Bible study, 20 years ago, <clears throat> I decided to do something different on Wednesday nights. I, de I decided to take a slow journey through the Bible. So we started in Genesis 1-1, and... Um, Next Wednesday evening, <clears throat> we will be in John chapter 15. So it's taken us 20 years to get that far. Now, actually, we went through the Old Testament quite quickly, but we have spent the last several years in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, <clears throat> Luke, and now John. Most of you know that the first three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. That's because <clears throat> much of their instruction is really very, very similar, if not exactly the same. And so those three Gospels line up <clears throat> very, very nicely with each other. However, John wrote his Gospel much later than the first three Gospels. In fact, John was uh, in his 90s by the time he wrote his Gospel, and it was toward the end of the first century when John <clears throat> wrote his writings. And so John knew about the other Gospels. He knew everything that had already been written. So John doesn't <clears throat> go back and redo a lot of the things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us. <clears throat> and he takes a different approach to so many of the events <clears throat> that are so familiar to us in the Synoptic Gospels. For example, when we get to chapter 13 <clears throat> in the Gospel of John, John decides to put together the teaching of Jesus <clears throat> that he did uh, really on the la in the last hours of his life on earth. Uh, we're, we're already into the Passover meal in John 13. And John lumps together teachings in 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 that Jesus spoke to them, and this was within hours of the time when he is literally going to be hung on the cross. So you might say that John 13 through 17 is, according to John, Jesus' last will and testimony. These are words he counts vitally important for his disciples to hear and to remember. Now, be conscious of the fact that they're not nearly as aware of the timing of all of this as he is. Jesus knows what is coming. The disciples, even though he has told them no less than about five times what's coming, it does not <clears throat> register with them. They cannot accept it. They will not let it into their mind <clears throat> that Jesus is going to be persecuted and suffer and he's going to die on the cross and he will rise again. They just cannot comprehend that. 
But even <clears throat> as they come to these last hours of Jesus' life, <clears throat> I love the fact that the Bible doesn't tell us fairy tales about its characters. It tells us the real story. And actually, if we were to go to Luke or one of the other gospel accounts, <clears throat> we would discover these closest followers of Jesus, the apostles, the twelve. They are actually still bickering a one, among one another as to who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Now, <clears throat> doesn't that sound like uh, a group of men who actually like each other and the way they show they like each other is they really gig each other and talk down each other and they are saying they're going to be the greatest. No, I'm going to be the greatest. I'm going to sit on his right hand. No, I'm going to sit on his right. They were very normal men and very normal human beings. So <clears throat> the way John decides to write <clears throat> the Passover situation, he doesn't write about the Passover meal and he doesn't write about what we call the Lord's Supper. But he decides to instruct the disciples in what they need to learn most exactly in this moment. And so here is a message that Jesus is going to not only, he's not actually going to speak much to them, but he's going to demonstrate to them what they need to see and what they need to learn. And according to Jesus, this is a lesson that is supposed to go on in our lives until he returns again. So let's see how John writes this account. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And here's the cue. And supper being ended, they have finished the Passover meal. The devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, there's another dark factor that's involved in this setting. <clears throat> Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from the Father and was going to the Father. Now, what does Jesus do in this setting? Verse 4, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? <clears throat> and Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, <clears throat> but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What an amazing picture that Jesus paints for these disciples. Now, Inherent here are customs that we know nothing about. The custom of coming together for a gathering in the ancient world of Israel meant that you got yourself ready 
and you washed and bathed yourself long before you ever left your house. But because the streets were made of dirt and the only shoes that people wore were what we would call sandals, they were simply a bottom piece of leather probably with a couple of three straps that go around the foot. As your feet walked through the powdery dirt of the streets wherever you were, the dust and the dirt of the street got on your feet. So when you got to the designated place where you were going to gather, it was customary that pots of, waters were, pots of water were sitting there, and usually, if it was possible, a servant was there to dip water, pour it over your feet, and wipe them clean as you went into the house so that everything about you could be clean once again because you're already clean everywhere else except your feet and now your feet are clean so you can go into the gathering and you can enjoy yourself with other guests. It is interesting that on this occasion nobody in this group of 13 men thought about doing that. Maybe it's because they were so busy <coughs> talking about themselves. And maybe it was because they were so busy demonstrating their own ignorance. They still are talking about Jesus establishing an earthly kingdom. I'm going to be the prime minister. I'm going to be the secretary of state. I'm going to be the treasurer. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that in the kingdom that Jesus will establish here on this earth. And Jesus has told them over and over, my kingdom is not in this world. It's not of this world. God's kingdom is in people's hearts, and the kingdom is everywhere the king is. So if the king is in your heart, you're part of the kingdom. But they're still thinking in material terms. And so even though they have gone through the process of looking at and participating in the age-old Passover meal that they have done all their lives, and even though Jesus has actually demonstrated to them this has a new meaning now. It's not just going to be from now on what happened coming out of Egypt. It's going to have a new meaning. It's going to be a new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. And he breaks bread and says, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. They still don't get it. And so once again, they're sitting at the table bickering, and Jesus very quietly gets up, goes over to the side, takes off his outer garments, wraps a large towel around himself, pours a basin of water, and comes over and begins to wash the dirty feet of his own disciples. Now, I'm sure the minute Jesus started this process, the conversation completely stopped. You could have probably heard a pin drop. Suddenly, their own egos and their own arrogance don't seem very important. What, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is our teacher, our leader. No rabbi would ever wash the feet of his constituency that gathers in the synagogue. No leader ever bows down before his army. What is Jesus doing? And once again, as on so many occasions, their minds are completely cluttered and confused. Peter seems to be the person who has the gift of speaking what he does not know and uh, speaking at the wrong time in the wrong way. So Peter observes Jesus watching, washing several disciples' feet. Everybody else is silent. And when Jesus gets to Peter, Peter says, Whoa, wait a minute. I, I can't have you wash my feet. <clears throat> now, Jesus tries to say, Peter, just don't talk right now. You, you don't understand. And the more you talk, the worse it's going to be. So just don't talk. And sometime in the future, maybe the near future, you'll understand this. 
But Peter says, no, absolutely not. You're not going to wash my feet. And so Jesus has to enter into an argument with Peter. And he says, Peter, you don't understand what I'm doing, so therefore you don't realize if I don't wash your feet, you're saying you don't have any part with me. Now notice how human Peter is. He goes from the wall of the extreme that says, don't, don't wash my feet, don't touch me. Now he goes to the other wall and he says, well, hey, if it's going to be like that, wash all of me. And Jesus goes, Peter, you're just as confused on that wall as you're on this wall. You, you've already been washed. You don't need a bath. I'm just humbly doing what nobody did in this setting. I'm washing the dirt off of our feet. Now, this passage um, has certainly been, in some ways, at times controversial because Jesus asked a very important question. Do you know what I've done when he got finished? Do you know what I've done to you? Well, people have been trying to answer that question based on this passage for hundreds of years, and people have come to a lot of different conclusions. <clears throat> Let me tell you the one conclusion that is not what Jesus was introducing in this passage. There are people who say, well, that's, that's the third ordinance. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, foot washing. And there are churches who have the ordinance of foot washing just like they have the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. We believe there's two ordinances, baptism, the Lord's Supper. Jesus was not introducing a third ordinance. But they would argue and say, but he said, if I did this to you, you should do it to one another. So see, you should demonstrate that. And I've actually been in settings where people have demonstrated that. I don't really think that's what Jesus is trying to teach the disciples because <clears throat> the necessity of washing feet like Jesus washed feet is not nearly as great today as it was in that day and time. So what was Jesus trying to teach his disciples? Number one, he was trying to teach them what humility looks like. You know, as Paul writes about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, he talks about the downward steps Jesus takes from glory. And then it says he became a servant and he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the death of the cross. And that whole picture is the downward steps of Jesus humbling himself to the lowest possible assignment on earth, death on the cross. But before he got to the cross, he became a servant. God builds his kingdom out of servants. And so Jesus is showing them what humility and service looks like. So how does this apply to the modern church? I think we can only get it and understand it if we realize this. Jesus was doing what nobody else wanted to do. Do you know in every organization, in every situation, in every place in the world, there are things that don't get done because nobody wants to do it. So Jesus is saying, here's an idea. If there's something that needs to be done and nobody wants to do it, why don't you do it? None of you guys want to wash the feet. You know it needs to be done. Look at our feet. They've got dirt all over them. You know it is something that should be done, but none of you want to talk about that. None of you want to do that. Apparently, in this gathering called apostles or disciples, they divided up the assignments. But you know what? On this night, nobody wanted to wash the feet. Jesus said, I'm going to show you what you do when that happens. You know why God's people sometimes have problems with one another? We're not interested in washing feet. 
We are interested, like the disciples, in our position, our recognition, our place inside the church, our situation inside of what we lead and what we do, and do people recognize and appreciate what I do in this church? Do you think in 50, almost 53 years, I've seen people live, leave the church because they didn't get their recognition they, de they thought they deserved? I remember a young man in my second church, and I have no idea why he decided he wanted to do this, but he wanted to be the Sunday school director. I assume he thought that was the most prestigious position in our church. It wasn't. And the truth is, he knew nothing about being a Sunday school director, but he decided to promote himself with the idea, I want to be the Sunday school director, and he knew there was a committee called the nominating committee that put together the Sunday school leaders and recommended to them church. So he talked to several on that committee. He even spoke to me, and then some of them spoke to me, and they decided not to ask him to be the Sunday school director because he didn't know anything about Sunday school. That's a pretty wise decision. So what does he do? He throws a shoe. He throws a fit. He quit coming to church for several weeks. You know what he did? He simply proved they made a wise decision. Now, what if somebody had said to him, you know, we're not going to ask you to be the Sunday school director, but we would like for you to clean out the baptistry before we use it every time we baptize somebody. Would you come up here and sweep and mop and clean the baptistry so that it's ready for the person who's going to be baptized? Would you be willing to do that? Not on your life. Nobody wants to do that. There's a lot of jobs in life nobody wants to do in that same church. <laughs> I remember an occasion when we had a deacons meeting, and I had some wonderful deacons in that church. Twenty of the one, most wonderful men I ever worked with, and we're in the biggest room we have to meet in, and we're having a meeting, <clears throat> and this wonderful couple had taken care of the church lawn forever. Now, they didn't just take care of the church lawn. It was immaculate. Y'all yeah, know what a nail lifter is, a little thing that looks like a screwdriver, but it's got a forked end on it, and you can raise a nail? They dug every weed out of the yard with a nail lifter. That's pretty meticulous. But... They got old. They said, we can't do this anymore. And I was very sad because they also mowed the lawn at the parsonage. <laughs> and so we're sitting in deacon's meeting, and the question comes up, who's going to water the lawn? I mean, every head went down. And you, you could just see. And, and let me, in their defense, let me say, the, <laughs> those were some of the hardest working, busiest men I ever knew in my life. I'm telling you. They were busy from daylight to dark most, most of the year, especially in the summer. And they're all just sitting there, no, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. And, and we walked out of that room that night. <laughs> Nobody volunteered to water the lawn. So the truth is it was headed to be the ugliest lawn in town instead of the prettiest lawn in town real quick. That's a pretty drastic change here just because some people have decided they can't do this anymore. That night, <clears throat> I only live a block from the church. The Lord convicted me and said, you need to water that lawn. You can do that. I didn't want to do that. But you know what I did? I never talked to those guys that did again. I just watered the lawn. And you know what Jesus said? If we'd be willing to do what nobody else is willing to do, it will actually elevate you in the eyes of those you do it for. All of a sudden, those guys thought I was a great pastor. Not because of my preaching, but because I was willing to go down there and move hoses and water the lawn so that it wouldn't look like a piece of junk and embarrass the church. 
That's what Jesus is talking about. He's fixing to go to the cross. He's fixing to leave them. He's fixing to put it all in their hands. And he said, guys, you've got to be willing to do what nobody else will do to make things work. Do you know that formula will solve almost all human relationship problems? If you're willing to do what nobody else is willing to do, it'll solve the problem. You may not like it, but I'm going to tell you a little secret. God blesses that kind of heart. That God blesses that kind of service. And Jesus said this right in the midst of the time that he introduced the Lord's Supper. And I think it's a good thought for us to have tonight before we actually remember what Jesus did. So now we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. We're still not ready to open the elements. So hang on, those of you that have a trigger finger here. <laughs> Paul received from the Lord, I'm not exactly sure how he received this. He was in Arabia, and he, he received a lot of things from the Lord, but he received the instruction for the Lord's Supper. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he writes down the first instruction as, how do you do the Lord's Supper? Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. May we pray together. Father, we are coming to one of the most sacred moments you have given to your church. It's not about us. It's all about you. It is an invitation for us to remember what we talked about this morning, the cross. It is an invitation for us to remember what happened to your body, not only on the cross, but before the cross, how you were beaten and slugged and spit upon, mocked and ridiculed and made fun of how you were unable to carry your own cross and Simon of Serene had to be summons to carry it for you and how they dragged your body out to the garbage heap of Jerusalem called Golgotha and how they laid your naked body down on the cross that is beaten half to death and nailed your hands to the cross and your feet to the cross and lifted that cross and let it fall, slam into the ground as your flesh tore from the nails that held you in the air. And Jesus, in that moment, you not only said to those below you, but to all of us, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. And as you hung on that cross and as every drop of blood in your body dripped out, your blood covered every sin that ever was committed, ever will be committed, and ever is committed in this world. And you paid the price for every sin of the whole world. And it was your broken body and your shed blood that makes our right relationship with God possible. So, Lord, tonight, examine our hearts. Call us to the cross. Call us to a new and stronger relationship with you. And help us as we take these elements to truly praise you and thank you for what you have done in our behalf. 
In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, you may now take the cup and peel off the clear topping and move to the bread. When you have the bread in your hand, I want to say a few words before we go any further. In John's Gospel, Jesus declares himself to be the bread of life. In John's Gospel, he says, this is the bread, not as the bread that came down out of heaven, this is the bread that comes from God. He that eateth this bread shall live forever, and you may partake of the bread. And then you may carefully open the second tab of your cup, and you don't even have to tear it completely off. Just leave it attached, if you will. And then hold it for just a moment. John the Baptist, upon recognizing Jesus as the Son of God, says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Why did he say that? Because the Old Testament teaches us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And Jesus, like the perfect lamb, would shed his blood on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of our sin. You may partake of the juice. There are slots in the back of the pew. You can set your cup. And here again what Paul says. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so I have preached a sermon tonight, but according to Paul, you have preached a sermon. And this sermon is the fact that without Christ dying on the cross, there is no forgiveness of our sin. We are thanking him tonight that his body willingly was broken for our salvation, that his blood willingly was shed, and that because now when God looks upon us, he looks at us through the blood of Jesus. And it is the blood of Jesus that washes away all of our sin. Now would you pray with me once again? Father, this is such a precious moment. Let it be not only special for this moment, let it be special throughout this week. Lord, would you open our eyes so that we might be able to see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear and obey what you want us to obey. Lord, you have divine appointments for us scattered all over southern Oklahoma. There are people you want us to connect to. There are people you want us to pray with. There are people you want us to speak to. There are people you want us to invite to the church and to the revival, and we have great opportunities. Easter is next Sunday. Many people would come if invited. Our revival starts two weeks from today, and many people would come if invited. So, Lord, would you let us do what people, even in God's kingdom, seem to not want to do, and that is to share the good news about Jesus. Also, Lord, you have promised that even if we give a cup of cold water in your name, it'll not go unblessed. So let us be the kind of people that go around this week looking for opportunities to do something that nobody else is willing to do not for our honor and glory, but so that we might demonstrate we serve one that has changed our hearts so that we're not like the rest of the world. Help us to want to serve rather than be served. Help us to be willing to use, be used of you whatever you would ask us to do. And now, Father, if there would be one in this room tonight that has never met Christ, we pray tonight even as we're dismissed, that they might come here to the front and say, Pastor, I need to talk about having Jesus in my heart. Or maybe someone has another spiritual need. We want them to feel free to do that. And Lord, we want you to go with us, but we want you to work continually right here in this place. 
Thank you that it's been a great day for God's people in God's house. And we pray next Sunday will be even better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to stand together and sing the doxology. Praise God from